Living afloat, is it the life for you? Estimates of how many people live aboard boats vary between 25 and 30,000, with most having two or more people aboard. Personal experience also shows that boats have become a refuge for divorced people with too little cash to buy a house, older people wanting to be rid of their mortgage and youngsters looking for cheap accommodation, all of whom often come to a boat with no experience of the waterways at all. And that's a trend likely to increase in these straightened times. Many people already live on boats on the UK canal system and most do it because it's the life they choose and love. It's not just existing boaters who dream the dream. We are regularly buttonholed on the towpath by people walking and asking about the possibilities. See, living on a canal boat can seem to be a very pleasant existence as you pass brightly painted cosy craft tied up alongside sunny country fields or in a handy friendly economic city centre marina. When Canal and River Trust and the Residential Boat Owners Association launched a survey to determine what boaters would like from their residential moorings, the answer was clear, many more of them. Every hire boater and leisure boater would have considered whether or not they could live on board a boat at some stage, quite apart from those who come to it as cheap housing. Now, after many years as a boat owner and the, and the last 16, 17 living on our 56 foot narrowboat in marinas and boat yards and cruising the entire canal system, uh, I thought we could maybe offer a no nonsense guide to living afloat. So, as I say, there are now some 37,000 boats on our canals, more than at the height of the Industrial Revolution, and one in six of them may be using boats as their home. And if we average out the estimates and add a pinch of salt and divide by two or three for the number of boats, then at least 6,000 of those 37,000 plus boats are homes for people who have abandoned dry land for a better quality of life on board a boat. And many more are considering it. So who wants to live on a canal boat? Retired people wanting to see the country, who sell the house, buy a boat and invest the rest. People opting out of the rat race, especially if they can work from home. Anyone wanting budget accommodation in an expensive area. People who just like canals. Overseas visitors wanting an extended tour of the real UK. Anyone wanting or needing to be mobile. It's uh, an endless list. So, is living on board for you? Most of us are not accustomed to the restrictions of life on the water, so we need to look at the downside, from confined spaces and limited storage space, to the simple fact that the boat moves around as you walk about inside, as well as the dream of floating along on sunny days through the best of British countryside. So the reality is that in a metal box, probably 60 foot long by seven wide and seven high, there's never going to be space for the grand piano or granny's oil painting. And if you thought downsizing from a house to a flat was traumatic, doing the same for a boat may well bring on palpitations amongst the acquisitive. There are, of course, halfway houses. You could opt for a wide beam vessel. And if you're simply looking for a home and not planning to travel that much, um, it, that would double the space and... Uh, it would be something like a compact apartment. You'd have to decide whether you're a northerner or a southerner at heart, of course, as there is no wide canal link between the waterways of Lancashire and Yorkshire and the broad waterways of the southern counties, at least none that don't involve a sea passage. Equally, you could live on an even larger vessel if you're happy to moor on a suitable river, but then we move away from having access to the real inland waterways. The price you pay for space is higher mooring fees, double in some marinas if you live a wide beam of vessel, and often higher still in marinas with sea access where the well-heeled moor their ocean-going yachts. But if you want to live on, a, on board a boat that enables you to travel all Britain's connected waterways, it means a vessel that measures at most 62 foot long with a beam of just 6 foot 10 inches 
Inside that elongated cube, you have to fit all your possessions, the essential facilities for cooking, washing and sleeping, as well as yourselves and your possessions. On a more basic level, you have to be prepared to bring on board all your water and to generate your own electricity. You also have to be prepared to dispose of all your waste, and that includes the contents of the loo. This is a lifestyle that brings you hard up against the realities of life without the hidden comforts provided by the piped water, gas, electricity, sewage and other facilities most modern householders take for granted. You really are totally aware of what you consume and where your waste goes. Some people can do it, some people can't take the confinement in the longer term. If you're lucky enough to be living on board as a couple or even a family, the available space has to be divided up still further and you have to be really comfortable about spending a lot of time in a small space with people you love. It helps tremendously if both parts of the partnership are genuinely of the same mind about living on board. Anyone whose partner is merely trying to please by agreeing to a waterborne life is kidding themselves. It will, it will be all right in the end. It's more likely to result in a split or a move back ashore and sooner rather than later. When you're deciding whether this is the life for you, bear in mind that the places where you can live as a residential boater are also limited. The marinas that will take static residential boats on a long-term basis are often those on the edge of industrialised urban areas, the outskirts of Manchester, Leicester or Leeds. As soon as marinas are able to label a city centre mooring as residential, the price often goes through the roof with Canal and River Trust seeking nearly twice the normal rate for such moorings in the centre of Leeds, and London prices easily topping seven or eight thousand pounds a year, more in the centre. The option to travel at least for the a few months on the system and then finding winter moorings is there, but there are a, lum a limited number of people who can manage their work or personal life to fit such a lifestyle. Of course, if economic reasons rather than the love of boats and the waterways are behind your reasons for living on board, then you'll either have to pay the price of a residential marina berth, if you can find one, or opt to play hide and seek with the Canal and River Trust enforcers who will be trying to see you don't overstay in any one spot. The rules are fairly simple, but rarely enforced with any consistency around the system, unfortunately. You have to be on a, a journey and you can spend no longer than 14 days moored in one spot before making the next stage of that journey. The dispute is usually about how far onwards a boat should move and how frequently it can return to somewhere it moored earlier. I know people who appear to be immune to the rules and those who abide by them religiously, but trying to run a normal working life, including owning a car, is massively complicated if you don't have a long-term mooring. In my experience, it's only those with a history of boat ownership or hiring who take all these things into account before they take the plunge of moving on board a boat. So I would strongly advise anyone to spend at least a week or two uh, working a boat before taking the plunge. Living on a Canal and River Trust marina's establishment in Lancashire a few years ago, I, I saw several newly divorced men arriving, often to buy new boats as cheap homes with their share of the equity from the family home. Some found a new interest and took their floating life to heart, taking courses on steering their new vessel, exploring the local canals and planning longer trips when they had the time. Others never moved their boats and even let the paintwork rust and flake away while they used the boat simply as a place to eat and sleep when not at work. To me, they seem to have sad, limited lives because they chose to see their boat just as a cheap place to live. And sometimes the sheer ignorance of the new liverboard is breathtaking. One lady who had recently moved onto her boat saw one of the marina's regulars filling up with water. Why are you doing that? she asked. And he explained that he filled his water tank every few days. Oh, I'm lucky, she told him. I have water taps on all my sinks and I just use them. <sighs> Finally, you shouldn't let sentiment and any kind of romantic notion about what living on a boat would be like 
to influence your decision when choosing the right boat to buy. And that's the next hurdle. <laughs>